Before this choir escapes, I would like to say thank you every week. I enjoy what you're doing. You're fantastic, and I bless you. And I bless Laura and Brian, who do a fabulous job with this choir and all this music. And I'll tell you, these musicians ain't bad either, are they? All right. I just appreciate all of them very, very much. Pastor called me last night about 9 o'clock and said, Wallace, I'm, I'm about as sick as I've ever been in a long, long time. Is it possible for you to fill in for me tomorrow morning at the 11 o'clock service? Pastor Busby is going to do the early service. And I said, of course. And it's my honor and my privilege to stand before you today and say, God bless all of you. We love you and we appreciate you very, very much. Last <laughs> December the 21st, this past December the 21st, it's Ernestine's birthday. And um, about 2 o'clock that morning, she went into severe pain in her body. And she suffered. I don't, I've never seen her suffer like this. She cried out in agony. Her left side was such pain she could not move her arm. We did not call Mark because... The Christmas program was going on and, uh, and that Sunday morning, and um, the Christmas program was going on, and we didn't want to disturb that. And so we, I prayed. When we didn't show up for service, Mark called and said, what's wrong? Because he knew we were supposed to be sitting right there. And uh, he said, what's wrong? And I told him what was wrong. He said, have you called the doctor? And I said, no. Your mother said, if I'm going, I'm going at home. I ain't going no, from no hospital. And I said, okay. Well, Van was there with him, and Van has some connections how to get people in a hurry. And Mark came back inside while Van was calling the paramedics to send to our house. Mark said when he told Pastor Gunner what was going on, he announced to you what was going on. And paid, made Mark a point of contact. And I'm going to tell you what. Prayer changes things. I heard the sirens coming. And the paramedics coming. They got in two teams of paramedics. And while they were coming in our driveway, I helped Ernestine get to the bathroom. And when she got to the bathroom, she lifted her hands and said, Thank God. And instantly she was healed. <laughs> instantly she was healed. And those six paramedics, I mean six, two teams, they stood around her bed. And I'm going to tell you what. She preached a sermon for about 30 minutes. And all they could do was stand there and listen. And, and, and the head man would say, but, uh, and she said, just a minute. And he said, uh, uh, she said, just a minute. And he said, uh, uh, she said, just a minute. She would not stop. She told about when she was a little girl. When she was a little girl and had pneumonia, was dying in Alma, Georgia. And her dad called the doctor. The doctor came out, examined her, and said, I can't do anything to help your little girl. As far as I'm concerned, she's dead. There's nothing that I can do. I need, I got people that I can go and help. And I'll call me when she finishes breathing, and I'll come back and, and declare her dead. When that doctor walked out of that door, Ernestine's mom and dad got down by the bed and said, God, you love Ernestine and you love us. And if there's anything in her life that, she can, that she'll be able to do to honor the kingdom Heal her, if not take her on to glory. Do you know 30 minutes later, she sat up in the bed and said, I want some cornflakes. How many know we're serving a God of impossibilities? A God of impossibilities. What did the book say? The book says, with God, all things are possible. Say it with me. With 
God, all things are possible. Say it again. With God, all things are possible. How many know there are no ifs with God? There are no ifs with God. He says not, use the old, I, I call it the ask formula. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. That's the ask formula. Use it. Use it. Somebody said, I got a three-word prayer. I said, what is it? He said, help. Thank you. Wow. That's a pretty good prayer. When you say help and God does it, say thank you. And when he gets through doing it, say wow. What an answer that God gives. Somebody say wow. I'm telling you, most of us ought to be saying wow a whole lot more than we are because every day we live under the protection of the God of impossibilities. There's nothing he can't do for you. Nothing he can't do for you. Are you in need of a miracle today? Are you in need of help today? And by the way, let me say this. I, 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 I want us to pray for pastor right now. Let's just take a prayer break right now. Reach your hand toward me and let me represent the pastor. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for our pastor today. I ask you to touch him. Heal him. Heal him. I prayed for him last night on the phone, and I thank you for what you're doing. And I thank you for a miracle of recovery for our pastor in the name of Jesus. Everybody say, in the name of Jesus. Amen. It is done. I'm telling you, when I ask God for something, I start thanking him for it. I don't keep on asking him and asking him. When I ask God for something, I start saying, thank you, Lord. 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 Are you filled with fear? Some frustrations? Is your marriage hurting? Are your children in trouble? Um, is debt destroying you? What about your relationships? Are they in frustration? Do you know how to get from where you are to where you want to be? The way to get from where you are to where you want to be is found in one word, God. Say it, God. God. Say it, God. God. Say it, God. God. My Lord, you feel like the devil is trying to kill you? He's trying to kill it. He tried to kill Ernestine, but he failed. He failed one more time. He failed. Hallelujah. Not only that, about four years ago, I woke up on Saturday morning and I started moving around and my left arm was uh, sort of numb and then it'd get all right and it'd get a little numb and then it'd get all right. We went out to a restaurant and it got numb and then it got all right and, and um, uh, we, we stopped by the fire station over here to just, I don't know why we did that, but we did it anyhow. We stopped by the fire station and told the, the firemen about what was going on and Ernest he said, what would you do? I can't tell you exactly what he said, but in essence, this was it. He said, it was my, my dad, I'd kick his what, all the way to the hospital. So we finally, that, late that afternoon, I went to the hospital, and then my side began to get numb. And then my cheeks, I felt like I had Nov Novocaine from my head to my toe when I was laying in the hospital right over here on South Cobb Drive at, um, what was that, St. Joseph? Mercury, uh, Mer um, yeah, hospital. You know, all know where it is. <laughs> they started treating me for a heart attack or a stroke. And they worked on me, put all kind of stuff on me and in my veins and everything and put me in a special room. This is about four years ago. Put me in a special room. And you know what happened? About 3 o'clock that morning, I was laying there and I couldn't go to sleep. And Ernestine said, are you asleep? I said, no. She said, God just told me to pray for you and he'd heal you. I said, all right, do it. She laid her hands on me and began to pray in the name of Jesus. And I can tell you, feeling began to come back in my arm and my left side. And hallelujah, hallelujah. How many know God takes care of his children? How many know you're God's child? I'm going to tell you, he's taking care of you. Believe it, believe it. The next morning, they took the ultrasound, tested me to see if my blood was flowing all right, put me in an MRI about noon twice, 
and examined me. And about 4 o'clock that afternoon, the doctor came by with all the report. He said, well, uh, every indication, and then first though, he examined me. Stand on one foot, see how you can move your arm and leg. He gave me all kind of tests. And he said, well, now, the report says you've had a stroke. But there's no indication that there was any damage done. And as far as I'm concerned, you can go home. We are serving a God of impossibilities for our families. I preached about family for 50 years. That's about the only thing I ever preached about was family. New life for the family is the name of our ministry. So we preached about family. We traveled as a family. God has blessed us and taken care of us in all kinds of ways. Now, last night I, I when pastor asked me if I'd speak. I said, God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to say? Everybody expects me to talk about family. And you know what God said, put into my spirit, tell about your family. Don't tell about somebody else because you have experienced what I have done for your family and you know how all about it. You don't have to say it happened to somebody over yonder 100 miles away. You can say, it happened to me. It happened to me. He said, just tell your life story. All right, here it is. Ernestine and I met at 18 years of age, fell in love, went crazy, got married. <laughs> she asked me, she said, uh, if you got a car, I'd been driving my daddy's car, dating her. I said, no, I don't have a car. She said, you mean you don't have a car? We were, and we were already married. I said, yep, that's right. Because we'd use my dad's car to go on a one-day honeymoon. One-night honeymoon in Jacksonville, Florida. Then I took her around in Valdosta, Georgia to introduce her to all my family. Then we came back to my dad's church on, uh, on Jessup, Georgia on, on a Saturday evening. I preached Sunday morning. Monday morning, we got a bus to go back to Greenville, South Carolina. We got us, uh, her, her mom and dad, after we'd been there about two weeks, they said, it's time for y'all to move out. I said, well, yes. Uh, what about it? He had already got me a job at a mill there in uh, uh, Greenville. And I enrolled in Furman University. I'd go to Furman University in the morning. I'd work from 3 to 11 in the afternoon at a mill. And Ernest, I finally got a car. An old car or an old Chevrolet, it used about as much oil as it did gas. <laughs> as a matter of fact, Ernestine, I, could, I worked in a, in, a, in a window taking socks off of metal springs that they'd put the uh, yarn on so they could dye it. And I'd take those socks off and Ernestine would come out there sometime because we only lived about three blocks from where I was working. And I, I, I drove the car over there one time and, and she came and got in the car, was in the car and she decided to drive. Now, her daddy had this. He was a little old-fashioned. He said, if, uh, she, he said, Dad, she said, Dad, teach me how to drive. And he said, if, if your husband wants you to drive, he'll teach you. And so I was going to teach her how to drive, and I tried. She was going to drive around the block and drove all the way around the block with the emergency brakes on. <laughs> I got out there, and I was just smoking a little bit because... You drove around the block like that. But I said, what happened? She said, I drove around the block. I said, you said, take the emergency brakes off. She said, what's emergency brakes? <laughs> well, we, I was evangelizing on the weekends. So I'd go, I'd catch a bus on, to go to school. I'd have to catch a, a city bus to go to school, city bus to come home. Most of the time until we finally got a car. And that was just before we left, left uh, Greenville and moved to Lenore, North Carolina to become associate pastor and janitor. More janitor than associate pastor <laughs> of a church running about five, six hundred people. And God began to bless us in a wonderful way. Then we moved to Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. And at age 21, I built a brick church 
in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, where Jensen Franklin's father was pastor after me, and Jensen Franklin got his call on God from the ministry in the church I built. Let me tell you about the first church we got, though. The first church I got after we'd been married about nine months was Conesty, South Carolina. And back in those days, 65 years ago, it was a little different than it is today. That's where the sewer dumped into the Saluda River, and they called it not Con- Conesty, but Conesty. <laughs> You'd need a gas mask when, when it was foggy to go down there because it was smelt so bad. We had one, only one member that had an indoor bathroom, indoor toilet, just one. With just about 80 people there, and, and God helped us, and we doubled it in about a year. We doubled our attendance. I had a man named Brother Cuckendall. He would bring me, a, he'd, he'd milk his cow before he came to church, get me a quart of milk, and said, Preacher, if you push me up to the top of that hill, I can, I can coast all the way home. Van? I've had some experiences. In that church, God began to bless. God began to bring people in. I remember a guy named Plick Ross. He came in, and, and, and his mama was a member of the church, but he liked us, and he wasn't a Christian. And he'd go down to the mill. There's about 300 people that worked in a mill down there in that town. That's the only industry they had. And uh, he'd invite people to the mill. He was mean. I mean, he was a devil. And uh, he'd invite people to church, and they say, yeah, Plick, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll come, and then not show up. And he'd get out in front of the church, and he'd be cussing, uh, cursing. And uh, <laughs> somebody said, Brother, but Pastor, Plick Ross is out there saying some nasty things. I'd go out there, and he, he was bigger than me. And I said, Plick, you're getting me in trouble, buddy. What you saying? I said, you know what the old saying is, if it once you don't succeed, try, try again. He said, all right, I'll go back and invite the old faithful liars again. So God blessed us. We moved and I built that church in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. Then I went to, uh, we pastored three churches. Then I went to Athens, Tennessee. We doubled that church. Then God opened the door for us to come to Georgia as a state youth and Christian education director. And that's where my office and your grandfather's office faced each other for 11 years. We worked together there. Uh, the Busby. And uh, God just did some wonderful things, wonderful things for us. As a, you know, it's amazing how God can take somebody that has nothing, and we had nothing to start off with. And some of you feel like I've got nothing, but I'm going to tell you a little as much when God is in it. <laughs> little as much when God is in it. God took a little old family. We resigned a position in Ohio, uh, and I was the next runner-up to be the International Director for Youth and Christian Education for the church, whole denomination of Church of God. And, and, and one day I walked into an office and, and handed my resignation to the overseer, and I said, I'm, I'm, re, I re, I'm, I'm re, resigning, and I'm going to go evangelize. He said, Wallace, you're going to lose votes. I said, I'm not running for anything. I'm going to tell you more important than position is to do what God tells you to do. And I did that. Mark was in the second grade. Dwayne was in the seventh, seventh grade. And um, so we moved back to Atlanta and bought a little house for $12,000. How many know that it's not much of a house for $12,000? $77 a month payments down on North Avenue, right in Inman Park area, and started evangelizing. Nobody's supporting us. Can I tell you, God can make a way when there seems to be no way. God can make a way when there seems to be no way. We had nobody supporting us. We spent all of our money. The second Christmas came around, and we had no money to buy Mark and Dwayne any Christmas presents, not a dime. I mean, we, we had, and Ernestine's sister said, go to our church where they've donated a bunch of stuff for homeless kids and get Mark and Dwayne a Christmas present. And that's how they got their Christmas present. 
Can I tell you, God, the devil will make you feel like you don't have anything. You're not making it. You can't do it. You can't do it. You're not going to make it. But I'm going to tell you, if you are trusting God, believing in him, you will make it. What the devil meant for evil, God turned it to good. I went to a friend of mine, Alan Kyle, who had a construction business because I would not go without my family. So on during the week, I'd work. I got me a job. I got me a job digging foundations and cleaning out houses for a builder. How many, how many has ever tried to dig a foundation in January when it's freezing cold and you stick a pick in the, in the, in the clay and you can't get it out hardly? It wasn't easy. Ernestine came one day to look where I was working, and I was cleaning out a house, and all the chalk dust had gotten to my head, into my hair, and she said, I thought I was married to a gray-haired man. <laughs> and we began to ask God for direction. And I'm going to tell you, God began to open doors. He gave us a TV show for several years. We recorded with our family over 150. 25 songs, sold thousands of them around the world. We did teaching tapes that, that uh, blessed people, thousands of people. We got a point with the churches that would seat 10,000 people, and we'd go to little churches. A pastor came up to me and said, Brother Wallace, would you come to my church? I said, sure. He said, I only got 25 people. I said, what does that mean? He said, I just didn't know you'd go to a little church like that. I said, you better believe I will. I said, the first opportunity to open door I got, I'll be there. It was in Alabama, about halfway between Montgomery and Birmingham. And one night I had, I went, one day I discovered I had a Sunday night open. I called him. He said, thank you, thank you, thank you. I went there to preach for him. And he was, he was right. <laughs> he didn't have 25 on Sunday night. A little lady walked up to me and was trying to give me $100. And I was having a struggle because... I, I was saying, thank you very much. I, you know, I, I appreciate that, and, 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 and I, I wouldn't reach for it. And the pastor walked up and saw what I was going on. He walked up to me and said, well, pa, uh, uh, Brother Swilly, let me tell you about this lady. Her husband is an invalid. She has to diaper him like a baby. And she struggled and struggled and struggled. And one day she said, God, give me an idea. Give me an idea. How many know you only need to meet one person or get one idea that will change your life? She was good with her hands. She could make brooms and mops. She began to make brooms and mops and peddle them. Stores up and down between Montgomery and Birmingham. He said, Brother Wallace, let me tell you. This woman's made enough money. She's paid for their home. She's got a brand new truck. She's got money in the bank, and she's the best tither I got. God is the God of impossibilities. Turn your faith loose. Turn your faith loose. Believe in him. Let him take care of you. God knows all about what you're doing. He knows about what's going on. Today, you may be here with problems circumstances that are out of your control. You may be here saying, what am I going to do next? My marriage is failing. My children are hurting. We stand right here every Sunday. And people come up here and talk to us and tell, about us, tell us about their hurts and their pains and their frustrations. And I can tell you, as a man of God, you cannot listen to somebody's hurts and frustrations without hurting yourself. It's impossible. When I hear them, I, my heart bleeds. And I put my hands on them and I begin to pray for them. And Ernestine begins to pray for them. And we declare over them divine direction. We declare over them divine wisdom. We declare on them divine prosperity. We declare on over them healing in the name of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you, it works. It works. It works. It works. You're in the right place at the right time to get your miracle. 
for your marriage and your family and whatever else it is. Perhaps he needs to interrupt. How many know God's a God of interruption? <laughs> God is a God of interruptions. He interrupts your schedule to give you direction. He interrupts your sickness to give you a miracle. He interrupts your problems to give you an answer. He interrupts your debt problems to give you an idea on how to make more money or how to handle the money well. He's a God of interruptions, and he interrupts the devil's plans. How many know God interrupts the devil's plans? Ah, oh, yes, he does. We recorded a song, If You Trust and Never Doubt, He Will Surely Bring You Out. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. And that's what I want you to do today. When you come, your burdens, come down here and bring your burdens, I want you to leave them there. Don't take them back. God takes them. And what does he do when he takes your pain and your agony and your sin? What does he do? Cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. When you, when you remind God of some of the past hurts and pains and frustrations that you have, you know what God says? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? That, that, that's gone. That's, that's covered. The blood covers it all. Becoming blessings come. Listen to this. Blessings come when we give God ultimate praise. The book says he inhabits our praise. Hello. God says he inhabits. He lives within your praise. He knows what. God's greatest desire is to bless and nurture and help you do what is right. God's interruptions come. Mark was telling me something one day. He said, Dad, I back in my backyard, he li lives over here on a lake, a beautiful, beautiful lake. And he said, I was mowing my lawn, and I was hurting. And he said, I was quoting the 23rd Psalm, that he would lead us beside the still waters. And he said, something in my spirit said, look at the lake. And he looked at that lake, and there was not a ripple on it. How many know God knows how to speak to us just when we need it the most? When we're hurting the most, when we're frustrated the most, when our families are struggling, when our finances are, 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 are overwhelming, it's just that time he will lead you by still waters. He restores your soul. My God, I don't know why anybody don't want to be a, want to, don't want to be a Christian. Somebody, I heard somebody say this morning on television, pastor said, I was with one of my members and he was dying. He said, don't be afraid. Your sins are forgiven. Your name's in the book. You got your reservations made. And so it's okay. He said, I'm not afraid. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. He said, I've done so little for him. When he's done so much for me, I'm going to be ashamed when I stand before him because I've done so little, so little to do for him what he's done for me. I know, Dr. Walker I, told me one time a little illustration. He said, when I lived in California, he said, there was a pastor that told, told me, one Sunday morning, <clears throat> an usher found a little boy wandering around the halls of the church long, way before Sunday school. And finally, the usher said, son, what are you looking for? And the little boy looked at him and said, sir, I'm looking for God. Can you tell me where to find him? I'm looking for God. Can you tell me where to find him? And he said, what are you looking for God for? He said, my mama's real sick. And I heard the doctor say last night, if God doesn't help her, she's going to die. And I'm looking for God because the doctor said God could help my mama. And the usher was so moved by that, he said, come with me. 
He took him, his little ragged looking boy, hard clothes that were not very nice. He took him to the pastor's office. He said, Pastor, I want you to hear this. And the little boy told him, Sir, the doctor said last night my mama was going to die if God didn't help her. And he said, I've come here looking for God. Do you know where he is? And the pastor was so moved by it until he said to the little boy, would you go with me? Could you stay here just a few more minutes? And he took him by the hand, and they walked out on the pulpit. And he sat the little boy down in a chair by, by, the, by his side. And the people began to say, what in the world's going on? What's that little throwaway-looking boy sitting up there on the platform by the pastor for? And after their devotion was gone by, the pastor got up and said, I guess y'all are wondering who my friend is who's sitting here with me today. My friend came to our church this morning looking for God. And he told the story about what the doctor had said. And he said, I'm going to ask this church, can he find God in our church? And one by one, One by one, they begin to stand on their feet and said, whatever it takes, whatever it costs, whatever his needs are, and whatever his family needs, we'll make it happen. I can tell you he found God. Can, God, can we find God in this church? I believe it. I believe we can. When Laura and the worship team and the musicians get to playing and singing, I'm telling you, my faith begins to grow. My faith begins to grow. I begin to believe God can do anything. 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 I think I mentioned to this one time. If you're not saved today, Billy Graham's daughter said, in every church pew, in every church pew sits a broken person, a broken person. If you're not saved today, I want to remind you, God loves you. Ernestine's hairdresser, great lady, she loves Ernestine, and she tells Ernestine, you're the best friend I know. You light up this beauty shop when you come in. And she tells him about Jesus, and she told Linda. She said, Linda, I'm telling God to reserve you a chair by me when I get to heaven. Because she knows Linda's not a Christian. But Ernestine came home, and I picked her up a week or two ago, and she had a tear in her eye. I said, what's wrong? She said, Linda said today, and she's had a rough life, a horrible life. She's not got a good life right now. I mean, she's got a daughter and a granddaughter that's, that's I'm not going to go into that. But it's, it's, it's not good. It's not good. It's bad. And she told Ernestine, she said, Ernestine, I guess I'll have to take my chances on going to hell. And Ernestine was broken, broken. Don't take a chance on going to hell. Can I tell you, eternity is a long, long time to be lost. I want Ernestine to come and sing a song that she's sung hundreds and hundreds of times. The musicians, she's sung hundreds and hundreds of times with the family. And I've seen many, many people find Jesus. Would you just bow your heads right now for a moment? How many in the house would say this? Brother Wallace, I'm not sure about my connection with the Lord. I'm just not real sure my name's recorded there. I'm just not real sure. Would you just lift your hand up and let me see it and put it right back down? You know what the book says? If you're ashamed to acknowledge me before men, I'll be ashamed to acknowledge you. Anybody? You say, Brother Wallace, I need to renew my faith. I need to renew. Anyone? Lift your hand. 
I want you to listen to the words of this song. Listen to it. I want you to hear these words. about it. Now why don't you let him won't you let him come in? to come in let me pray for you I'll do it if you're not sure if you're not sure and now he's calling again just to see if you're willing to open the door oh how he wants to come in all right now let me say this. I've been in the house. Thank you, Lord. What's happening is worth the whole world. Jesus loves you. She believes it. In the name of Jesus, lift your hands and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, folks. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, if there's anybody here hurting, you're frustrated, got a problem in your marriage, your family, your pro debt, relationship, I want you to come here right quick. Just come here right quick. Line up right here. 